Okay, so today's talk is going to be mainly about uh, uh, open source and open science uh, concepts uh, as applied to, to gravimetry. So I'm hoping to cover some of the tools that, that we develop, uh, some of the challenges with developing these tools and, and uh, some of the opportunities as well for getting involved and uh, contributing to the wider community. I really want to acknowledge my, my two co-authors here, uh, Santiago Soler and, and Agustina Pese. They're uh, both from Argentina and they, they've been working with me and in, in Fatiando for quite a while now. Um, and without them, like the project really wouldn't have gone very far. Um, and as always, uh, uh, all these slides are, are um, Creative Commons licensed, so feel free to take screenshots or share any of this if you want. Uh, okay, so the main topic of this talk, as, as Angela said, is going to be the Fatiando Terra project, uh, which is Portuguese for slicing the earth. Uh, so this is a collection of open source tools for geophysics, mostly written in Python, and they cover a, a wide variety of subjects but most of them are somewhat focused on gravity and magnetics because that's my main field of research. Uh, so I wanted to start this off with a, a little bit of, uh, of the history of the project. And it's, it's always fun looking back and seeing the progress. Uh, and I find that the, the change in the logo really exemplified uh, the maturity of the, the project as we went forward. So we went from uh, a very amateur rough looking logo to something that looks half decent. And as Santiago likes to say, this really reflects my uh, ability with using the Inkscape graphics design software, <laughs> uh, which improved a little bit during the years. All right, so our, our journey starts in southeastern Brazil, uh, mostly in the city of Sao Paulo, which is uh, this blob right here, and Rio de Janeiro, which is uh, pretty close to Sao Paulo, actually, but it's another metropolitan area. And the, the project itself started around 2008 as a graphical user interface or a GUI for 2D gravity modeling that was uh, being developed by myself and some fellow undergraduate students at the University of Sao Paulo. Um, so uh, I managed to find uh, this, which is an actual diagram of our planning, uh, one of the first sketches we made for, for the project. Uh, which was originally going to be developed in C++. And we were planning uh, how to tie different forward modeling with different uh, polygons and user interfaces and so on, uh, which actually kind of never got off the ground. But uh, this was where the original idea and the, the name came from. So the project transitioned into a Python library at around 2010 when I started doing my master's in, in Rio. And I was working with gravity gradient 3D inversion at the time. So I was developing quite a bit of code so that I could uh, program some of these methods, uh, which uh, back then the, the gravity gradient data was pretty new and just coming out. And there weren't really any uh, 3D inversions available. Uh, so we were trying to develop that. And what I ended up doing was just putting all of this code that I was writing into the, the Fatiando package. And um, I can actually say the exact time and date when I did this, it was April 30th, 2010, uh, because all of this was registered in our Git repository, or at the time it was, wasn't even Git, but uh, we've been keeping the project under version control since the very beginning. So it's nice because even now I can go back and I can look and I'll share a link to these slides later. So if you click on the link here, you can see uh, this actual screenshot, it, it still exists and uh, it's still live. So it's pretty fun to go look. All right, so as the, the project development started, I ended up learning quite a bit about software development, uh, way beyond just uh, the, the standard programming that we learn as, as undergrads or, or graduate students. Uh, this involves uh, using version control, so something like uh, Git and, and GitHub. Um, in fact, we went through three different systems, uh, which are actually all present in this image. So first we were using one called subversion, which is the SVN here in the message. We then converted the subversion repository into a mercurial repository, which is the HG here. Uh, and that in turn got converted into Git, which is what is now uh, available on GitHub. 
Uh, we also learned about writing automated tests, about packaging software, writing documentation, and um, uh, the, this huge, vast world of knowledge that uh, is really difficult to come by because it's not usually taught in introductory classes. And you kind of have to learn on your own by reading other, people co other people's codes and uh, looking at online tutorials and things like that. Uh, kind of thing that, that under, uh, or graduate students usually would have the time to do. All right, so around 2011, we decided to actually build the first website and gallery. And back then I was working with a, a, a fellow a graduate student who was doing similar research. And we were teaching, uh, going to teach an inverse problems class. So we packaged up all the code we were writing for Fatiando uh, into this, this website. And we actually built a 2D GUI uh, that was very limited, but it served our purposes for, for teaching mostly. So you could draw a polygon, set its density and error, and it would do the, the forward modeling. Uh, so this actually ended up being quite useful for teaching, but we also built things around um, straight ray tomography for, for experimenting with inversion methods, uh, vertical seismic profiling, and also a, a bunch of gravity modeling as well uh, with prisms, polygonal prisms, and uh, several different geometries. Uh, one thing I really like about this screenshot is that our social media at the time was Google+, Plus, uh, which really puts a date on, on this website. Um, so after that, we kept uh, building, uh, improving the project and making releases. So when version 0 0.1 came out, we had a, a new website that was built using the, the Sphinx documentation system, which is what is used for the official Python documentation and pretty much every Python project out there. Um, and we kept uh, making releases and improving the code. Uh, at some point, Santiago and other contributors joined the project and started also helping out with development. And we made several releases until we put out version 0.5 in 2016, uh, which is what you can see here. So there's a, a lot of difference between the initial website and capabilities and what we had uh, by the end in, in 2016. Um, so there were many good parts to this. We, we actually ended up developing state-of-the-art algorithms because that's what our research was, right? So all of the things that we were developing as part of our master's and PhD research was all included into the, the Fatiando library. Um, so it was uh, very useful and it was a, a tool that was used in several theses and papers, particularly uh, in the, the lab we were in in, in Rio, they, they still use uh, rely on this software quite heavily. Uh, we had around two to three active contributors at a time with some people coming and going. And it did enable quite a bit of teaching through this through simulation. So instead of showing the students slides, we could actually give them code, that they could experiment with and test things like uh, um, upward continuation and uh, reduction to the pole by varying uh, magnetic uh, uh, the magnetic induction direction. They could uh, experiment with modeling and, and uh, do some inversions and uh, check out what, what the limitations and capabilities were of all these methods for themselves. But there were also quite a few bad parts. Um, mostly there were way too many toy problems and experimental code uh, that didn't really go anywhere and we weren't actively maintaining. Uh, the code was also not designed for testability. Uh, and by testability, I mean uh, being able to have um, unit tests that are automated so that you could quickly verify if the software still works. Uh, so it was really not designed for that because I was learning as I was going. Uh, it was also, uh, because of this, it was very difficult to maintain because we could uh, easily make changes in one part of the code that broke the rest of the code and we wouldn't realize it until someone uh, complained. Uh, all of this made for very unstable foundations for the growth of the project. Um, and because of all of that, uh, in around 2018, we decided to um, kind of stop development on the Fatiando library and uh, start designing new code from scratch with all of the lessons that, that we had all learned in the past uh, eight years or so. Uh, so we, one, we split the project into several different libraries instead of trying to put everything into one. 
because uh, our initial goal was to try to cover as much of geophysics as we could, uh, which of course is uh, very unrealistic. And it's the idea of a, a, a young, ambitious uh, a group of, uh, of graduate students, which then realized that things don't quite work that way. Um, we also decided to adopt better coding practices from the start so that every bit of code we built would be a very stable foundation upon which we could build the rest of the, uh, of the tools. Um, we were started using some more modern tools for, for testing, for documentation, and even just things that came out in the past couple of years for parallel computing and for accelerating the code. Um, and we also started looking at the, the nascent ecosystem of geophysics software that, that's being developed in Python. Because back when we started, there really wasn't anything uh, widely available. There was maybe one or two different packages, but now the, the whole ecosystem is very broad and there's uh, a lot of capability that other software packages offer that we could never hope to match. So we're really designing these tools to fit into this ecosystem and supplement it instead of trying to uh, re-implement things that already exist elsewhere. All right, so the, the current tools, the first one we developed uh, is a, a tool called Pooch. And this is not even geophysics related. It's a tool for downloading and caching data files on your computer. And this is used by pretty much all of our other libraries, as well as several big libraries in the, in the, the, the scientific Python ecosystem so that you can include sample data sets with the documentation um, so that, that we can actually have real data used in tutorials and documentation and things like that. Um, then we, we built a, a library called Verde, which is a machine learning based uh, point data processing and, and gridding uh, library. So it includes things like uh, uh, block averages and means and standard deviations, uh, trend fitting and, and interpolation and projection of grids. Um, then we started to work on Harmonica, which would be our gravity and magnetic processing library. And it also includes some modeling and inversion. Um, so this is uh, solely focused on analytical solutions to uh, um, forward modeling problems. So we're not going the partial differential equation route, which is already covered by other software. And this heavily relies on the framework that we built around Verde. Uh, so this is in, in continuous development at the moment. We're really testing new ideas and developing it from scratch. Uh, we also then uh, started working on a library called Bool, which handles the reference ellipsoids and normal gravity calculations, which were initially a part of Harmonica, but upon speaking with uh, uh, other projects like the SH Tools Circle Harmonics package, uh, we realized that we all had similar code for representing ellipsoids and calculating normal gravity. So we banded together into this one library that we're um, hopefully will all share. Um, so we're building a shared dependency uh, with this, which lets us have uh, focus the development to make it uh, better and better instead of having different people working on the same, pretty much the same functionality in different projects. And uh, lastly, we're started developing now a library called Rockhound, which is going to be a repository for all the sample data that we want to use in our tutorials. So we're gathering a, a bunch of public domain data sets that we can use uh, for, for teaching and, and for documentation. All right, so to uh, make things a little bit different uh, on this uh, June afternoon, uh, I wanted to do a little live demo so that, that uh, you wouldn't get too bored with listening to me drone on and on and on with the slides. Uh, so I'm gonna jump over here to a, a Jupyter notebook that I have running. And this is one of the main ways with which we interact with Python code when you're doing data analysis. So these are very popular and you can actually run, uh, you can even run Fortran uh, code in these notebooks nowadays. So they, they're very versatile and I highly recommend uh, checking them out. They're, they're a big boom to, uh, particularly for teaching and uh, they, they are really good for that. All right, so for this live demo, we're going to uh, process some gravity data using the current tools that we have and the current functionality. 
Okay. Um, so if uh, also if the font size is a little bit small, please let me know and I can make it larger. Um, so we're going to start off by importing all of the standard Python libraries that you would use. So there's NumPy for matrices and linear algebra, pandas for handling tables and uh, CSV files, and XArray, which uh, is one of the new tools I was mentioning that handles grids and uh, uh, multidimensional arrays with physical coordinates. So things like NetCDF grids and things like that. Uh, we're also going to load PyProj, which is the, the Python wrapper for, for the Proj library that does projections. Uh, we're going to load PyGMT, which is one of the other projects I, that, I, that I work on that lets us make GMT figures in Python in, in the notebook. And then we're going to load the current Fatiando stack. So we'll load Pooch, we're going to load Verde as VD, Bool, and Harmonica. Right, so I'm going to run this run this cell to import. And the first thing we need to do is actually download uh, all the data that we want to use. Uh, so we're going to grab this uh, uh, public domain gravity data set from the Bushveld complex in South Africa. So what I have here is the URL where we host the, the CSV gravity data. And I also have a different URL that has the, uh, the topography NetCDF grid for, for the Bushveld area. And I also have the MD5 checksum for all these so that I can verify that the download was, was correct. All right, so I'm gonna run this. And if I wanna grab these data sets and have them on my computer, one way to do that is to use pooch. So I'm gonna type path underscore grav, and this is gonna be equal to pooch.retrieve. And I have to give it the URL. So URL grav and the known uh, hash or the checksum, which is the MD5 graph. And I can do the same thing for the topography with pooch.retrieve URL topo and the known hash as the MD5 of the topography. All right, so with these two lines of code, when I run them, Pooch will check if these files are already on my computer, and if they aren't, it'll download them and verify that the download was correct by the, by the hash. So if I run this cell again, there won't be any download because the files already exist. So you can use these, uh, the same code cell in all of your notebooks that, that need that data set, and only one version will be downloaded. So this can really save quite a bit of disk space. So as you can see, the, I have the files here on my computer. And then I can use standard Python tools to load. So for the CSV, I'm going to use pandas. So pd.readcsv. And I give it the file name or the path to the file. So path grav. And this gives me my gravity data set. So I have latitude, longitude, uh, elevation, and absolute gravity. So there is uh, about 4,000 points. And I can use XArray to load the topography. So topography equals xr.load data array. And I can give it the path to the topo topography. All right, so this loads this NetCDF grid of topography, uh, which has a bunch of metadata and all that associated with it, right? Um, then I can. Uh, I'm not going to go over the PyGMT code, but I can, with a few lines of code, I can make a nice GMT plot in the notebook with the data that's in Python uh, now. So this is the observed gravity, and this is a hill shaded version of the topography um, that, that's in, um, um, if I'm not mistaken, these are geometric types because we, we converted them. All right, so once I have my data, I can start calculating the gravity disturbance. Right, because I uh, what I want to do in the end is make a grid of residual gravity. So to to get the gravity disturbance, I need to calculate normal gravity from uh, the 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 reference ellipsoid. So in this case, I'm going to use WGS84. So I'm going to say that my ellipsoid is from bool. I'm going to grab the WGS84 ellipsoid, which already has all the constants uh, included in it. Then I can calculate normal gravity by calling ellipsoid, 
ellipsoid.normalgravity and giving it the data dot latitude, latitude and data dot height, or sorry, elevation. Right, and this is gonna calculate normal gravity for me without using free air corrections. So this uh, evaluates normal gravity at the particular point that you want using the closed form expression from, from Lee and Getz uh, from 2001, I think. Um, so this is a, a pretty nice. So we can basically ignore free air corrections if we're calculating disturbances instead of anomalies. And now I can add the disturbance to my, my data frame. So this is the disturbance is going to be equal the observed gravity minus normal gravity. All right, so when I do this, I have a new column here with the gravity disturbance, and I can then plot it with PyGMT. So that gives me a nice figure here with the gravity disturbance calculated with an analytical formula. Um, so now, uh, from now on, we're going to work in Cartesian coordinates, so I need to project the data. Uh, so to do that, I'm going to use PyProj and define a Mercator projection. That is this projection function. And then I can use it to calculate uh, data easting and data northing coordinates, which are going to be equal to the projection. And then I can give it data dot latitude latitude.values and data.longitude.values. Actually, I think these are the wrong way. Uh, yeah, so sorry, that's longitude here and latitude here. All right, so by doing this, I now have two more columns with the Mercator projected, uh, projected easting and northern coordinates for all of my data. And to project a topography grid is a little bit trickier. So we could do that with, uh, with GMT, but if I wanna use the exact same projection, um, it, it could be helpful to reuse the same function here, just so I'm sure that it's the exact same projection. Uh, and Verde provides a function for that. So I'm gonna use uh, here, I'm gonna make a topo plane grid, and then I'm gonna call verde.projectgrid. And I'm going to give it the uh, topography grid and the projection. Topo plane. Right. So, what this does is uh, it projects the coordinates and it, it does a, a nearest neighbor interpolation so that I can get the, the, new, the, the, the new grid and so that it's also a regular grid in the projected coordinates. Right. So, this gives me a new um, X array grid. Um, and now I want to do some topographic correction. So I, I don't want to do a boogie correction uh, with a terrain correction. Uh, I want to directly calculate the effect of topography with uh, a prism model that we have in harmonica. So to do that, I'm going to create this prism layer from harmonica. And what I need to give it is the coordinates of the center of the prisms, which in my case are going to be topo plane dot easting and topo plane dot northing. Uh, I also need to give it the surface of the topography. Uh, so this could actually describe any layer, but in this case, I'm using the topography. So this is going to be topo plane dot values. So the values of the topography, the reference surface for this layer is going to be the zero reference height. And I need to assign a density as well for, for my topography model. So I'm going to do 267 kilograms per, uh, per meter cubed times numpy dot ones, ones like uh, topo plane. So, so that I generate a matrix of 267 values, one for each prism in my model. So once I do this, I get this other grid then, that sorry. represents the model. Sorry. Here, yeah. we can also use uh, variable density, right? Uh, so yes, so you, you could assign, term. yeah. So if you, if you have a matrix or, or a grid of densities, 
uh, you could plug that in here and you could have uh, each prism with a different density. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So for the moment, you can't do like a vertical varying density, but that's definitely something we want to add in the future so that we can do uh, use this to do sedimentary basin uh, inversions, for example. Uh, right, so now that I have my, my topography model, I can forward model the, 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 topograph the topographic effect on the computation points that I have. So for that, I'm gonna define some coordinates. So these are the computation point coordinates and they're gonna be data easting, data northing, and data dot elevation. Uh, then I can calculate the terrain effect by calling the topo prisms dot uh, prism layer dot uh, gravity. So this calculates the gravity of this prism layer. And what I need to tell it are the coordinates where I want to calculate and which field I'm calculating. And in this case, it's GZ. Right, so the downward component of the gravitational acceleration. Right, and this gives me a, an array of terrain effects. So when I run this, it's gonna take a, a couple of seconds, but it'll calculate the gravitational effect of each of the 419 by 240 prisms on each of the computation points. And uh, um, sorry, I don't, I don't have the profiler here to show, but we've managed to make this code automatically use all the cores on your machine. So it'll do this calculation in parallel, uh, which makes it uh, pretty effective. So it's not, um, we, we've invested quite a bit in making this code as, as fast as we can. Uh, we don't yet have near and far zone separation, which is something that we're looking to implement in the future. But uh, the, at least the, the foundation is there for, for solid performance. So uh, while we wait for that to finish, I'm going to then be able to calculate my bouguer disturbance. So I'm going to say data bouguer equals data dot disturbance, disturbance minus the terrain effect. All right, so uh, in total, it took about a minute to do all this calculation, uh, which was quite a bit. And we, we don't really need as detailed the topograph, uh, topography model for, for the survey. But if we already do, uh, then it's not infeasible to calculate. And so it's, it's pretty efficient, especially if you have a fast computer. All right, so once we do that, uh, we have our Bouguer disturbance or topography free disturbance which we can once again plot with PyGMT. So as expected, this is mostly negative because we're in the middle of the, the continents. So if we wanna actually see the Bushveld uh, geology, we first have to remove, a, a, let's say a second order trend. And we can do that with Verde as well. So we can make a trend that is gonna be vd.trend. I can specify a degree for this trend, which let's say two, and I can pass it my coordinates and data dot boogie. All right, so this is gonna fit a 2D, uh, um, a two dimensional second order polynomial to the data. And once I have the fit, I can calculate data residuals by saying data dot boogie minus trend dot predict at the data coordinates coordinates All right and you could also grid the the trend if you wanted to or grid the the residuals as well um, so what i ended up with after that is my residual field on all the different computation points and as, as a final thing i want to do is grid these residuals but the topography here is very varied, right? There, there's uh, quite, uh, uh, quite a bit of, of, of variable topography and these uh, are ground data. So the elevation for them vary quite a bit. So if we were to just do a spline interpolation here, it would completely ignore all of that. Uh, so our, our preferred method here is the equivalent sources method, uh, which um, 
in, in geodesy, it's often called, um, uh, um, so this would be like a Cartesian version of spherical basis functions, basically. Right, so uh, harmonica provides uh, an equivalent source implementation. So if we want to do, let's create a, an equivalent source model, which I'm calling EQL. And then I can say hm.eql harmonic. And you may have seen that we also have a spherical version of this, which would work in spherical geocentric coordinates. Um, I have to specify a damping here, which I'm, I'm going to cheat. And so uh, a reasonable damping is about 100. And I have to specify the depth of the equivalent sources, which in this case, I'm going to say uh, about 10 kilometers. Right. So the, the deeper the sources, the smoother the interpolated field. And once I have that, I can fit the equivalent source model on my coordinates and data dot residual. Right. And so this is going to run, basically do an inversion to try to estimate coefficients of equivalent sources um, that fit the observed data. And notice that this is actually pretty fast. Uh, a, a lot of the, the code is parallelized. So uh, building a sensitivity matrix and uh, calculating predictions, that's all uh, done in parallel. Uh, so now I, uh, that took about five seconds to compute. Uh, finally, then I want to generate a grid of these residuals, but I kind of want to generate the grid in, in geographic coordinates instead of Cartesian coordinates. And uh, again, the equivalent sources and the and Verde, they let me do that quite easily if I have the projection. All right, so first I need to get the region in geographic coordinates. So this is the west, east, south, north boundaries. So I'm going to call Verde.getRegion on the first uh, first two coordinates. Oh, sorry, not, not the coordinates. So in uh, data.longitude and data.latitude. So this is going to give me the boundaries of the region in latitude, longitude, degrees. All right, so I can say here uh, eql.grid to generate a grid. And I'm going to give it the region I just calculated. Uh, I can specify a height for the uh, for the the grid. So since we are fitting data with an equivalent source model, we can actually predict the grid at any height that we want. So in this case, let's do about uh, 220 or sorry 2,200 meters, which is above all of the topography in this region. But this could also be variable topography. It could also be uh, uh, higher up or lower down, though lower down is not necessarily good because of downward continuation effects. Then I can specify the spacing for the grid in degrees. So let's say 0 0.02 degrees of, of spacing. And I can give it my projection function. And the rest is a synthetic sugar. So if I run this, I'm using the model that I just fitted to predict gravity values on all of the points of the grid at the particular height that I specified here. All right, so this also ran quite quickly because it's also using all of the, the eight cores that I have on my machine. So this generates a, a grid uh, in latitude and longitude coordinates uh, of the residuals, which once again, I can plot with PyGMT uh, along with all the data points. So what I get at the end is a, a, a gridded, uh, residual topography at a constant height. If I wanted to do upward continuation, the only thing I have to do is change the height here. So let's say if I do it uh, at eight kilometers instead of 2000 or 2000 meters, then it takes roughly the same amount of time to compute. And what I get at the end is a smoother version because I was able to upward continue the data, right? Okay, so the, this covers most of the current capabilities that we have, uh, at, at least the, the main capabilities in, in Harmonica. Uh, there are a lot of other things that you can do with, with Verde in particular, which is the more mature package that we have. And uh, I, I highly recommend checking it out. Uh, so I'm going to jump back here into my, my presentation. Uh, let me just grab a little drink.
and some of the ongoing developments that that we have are uh, we're really been focused on on the equivalent source uh, models and we've been using a technique called gradient boosting from machine learning to try to scale the the equivalent sources to to millions or or uh, hundreds of millions of, of data points even on something like a, a small laptop um, so this uh, it is available as a preprint on earth archive by by santiago and myself uh, with the method uh, we just got back some uh, minor revisions for this uh, so it should be appearing on on gji in um in a couple of months hopefully by the end of the year so as an example from from the preprint uh, we gridded a ground gravity data set from Australia that has about 1.7 million data points. Uh, we were able to interpolate this on a regular grid um, with, um, let's say, uh, how long did it take? I think it took maybe an hour to generate the grid. And uh, it, we did this all in under 10 gigabytes of RAM. So this is a, a pretty efficient method that the Santiago and myself have, have developed. Uh, the code for this is coming to Harmonica in the next few months, and I, I feel like this is really going to enable using these methods at, at a much larger scale than, than we currently do. Uh, other things that are currently in development are frequency domain transformations, uh, like uh, upper continuation, reduction to the pole, derivatives, uh, that sort of thing. And we're currently, we, we have a, an open pull request in Harmonica. So please feel free to take a look and, and chime in and join the discussion as we design these, uh, which they the theory behind them is quite simple, but in practice, um, th there are some tricky bits uh, like uh, padding the grid and, and things like that that really affect the result. So we're really trying to get this right. Uh, we also have an ongoing uh, discussion and plans for implementing triaxial ellipsoids into Bool. Uh, this is mostly motivated by, by planetary science uh, applications when uh, we can't use normal oblate ellipsoids or spheres for representing some of these bodies. So we're really hoping to kind of generalize the normal gravity computations to uh, basically arbitrary uh, ellipsoids. Uh, we also have been doing some large reorganizations of the documentation. So uh, Pooch version 1.4 was the first. So you can click on the link afterwards and uh, check out the new version of the documentation. Uh, we're also gathering uh, quite a, a few open access data sets that we can use in our tutorials and all of our documentation so that the examples we show are using real data, uh, which makes them uh, much more immediately applicable. Uh, and all of these are going to be included in the Rockhound library uh, within the, the, the next few months. Uh, we're also really aiming to increase recruitment and, and diversity for, for our community. Um, because uh, particularly with, with open source development work, it tends to favor uh, people with, with spare time, basically. Um, so we really are trying to engage a more diverse community and trying to think of ways that we could possibly fund people to work on these projects so that we don't self-select people from privileged backgrounds uh, uh, like myself. Uh, so we've been partnering heavily with an organization called uh, Hell Latinas. So several of our uh, recent members are uh, involved with, with that, uh, that project, which is really awesome. Uh, it's worth Googling and trying to find out more about them. All right, so the main message we've had is that um, a lot of times people will come for the code, but if you want people to stay, the reason people stay in these projects is for the community. This is one of the biggest selling points of, of Python tools is that the code is good, but the community of people involved is even better. Uh, so we're really hoping to nurture that for, for Fatiando. Uh, so if you're interested in getting started, uh, if you're not experienced with Python, uh, you may have seen from the example that you can do uh, you can use the tools without a lot of actual coding. So you, you may have seen, noticed the lack of for loops or, or anything really fancy in, in the Python code. Um, but if you're new to Python, Software Carpentry has some really great open access introductory lessons aimed at scientists. And if you can find a workshop near you, then I highly recommend it. Uh, they're, they're a really good resource. 
Uh, you can then move on to maybe watching some of the tutorials we have on YouTube. So at the Transform 2020 and 2021 events, uh, we gave tutorials on Verde and, and Harmonica. So these are uh, um, between uh, one and a half and two hour long, but there's code that accompanies them if you'd rather read or, uh, or, or you can watch the tutorial or even in the background just to get an idea of what we can do. Uh, there's a documentation for each of the, the libraries and there are links in our, uh, on our website and we try to maintain them and, and keep them as complete as we can. Uh, that's not always possible, but uh, we do focus very heavily on, on documentation. Uh, but also if you're interested in getting involved in the projects beyond um, using them, there are many ways that you can participate. Uh, so you could write some code if there's anything that you need for your job or you want to have, but we don't currently support. Uh, we welcome code contributions and we could really use uh, uh, all the help we can get. Uh, but you could also uh, look at the documentation, uh, maybe fix the wording somewhere, write examples. Uh, that's all very valuable. It's oftentimes much more valuable than, than just coding contributions. Um, we also welcome feedback and uh, new ideas. Uh, you can join the conversation that, that we have and I'll, I'll give pointers to that later on. Um, share the expertise that you may have in the, the methods or the applications. That's all very valuable that we could use. And with all that help guide future developments so that the projects are maybe even more useful for, for yourself and for others. So uh, your help is really always welcome, uh, no matter which form it takes. So you can find us pretty pretty much everywhere on the internet. We have a Slack, uh, which is a, a basically a chat room uh, where we talk about uh, meetings and events and answer questions and share experiences. Uh, we also use GitHub quite, quite heavily, and that's where most of the development discussion takes place and where we review code and discuss uh, basically details of, of development. Uh, we started experimenting this year with having regular video calls. So we have monthly community calls, uh, which are for mostly for socializing and big picture planning. So things like, uh, like grants and future project directions and uh, organizing events and things that we can do. And we are also having weekly development calls on, on Fridays to discuss uh, more details of, of the development. Uh, and both of these calls are really open to anyone uh, of all uh, skill levels. So we really welcome any, anyone to participate and we're usually a pretty lively bunch. Um, so uh, actually, uh, I just wanted to quickly say as well that we have a community call planned for this Thursday. Uh, so it's a, a bit late in Germany because we have some friends on the other side of the globe who might want to join. So we try to alternate between uh, 4 p.m. UTC and, and 7 p.m. UTC. But uh, if you'd like to join us, uh, we more than uh, welcome. So uh, join the Slack and we'll post links and updates there. All right, so if you want to find out more about Fatiando, you can go to fatiando.org. Um, um, if you want to know more about the, the research that we're doing here, uh, particularly uh, me and Santiago, uh, uh, you can go look at the CompGeoLab website and the slides and the, the demo code that I just showed are all available on this GitHub repository. And I'll, I'll post the link to this in the Zoom chat so that you, you don't have to try to type this out. And with that, uh, I want to thank you for, for the invitation and for bearing with me uh, throughout this talk. <laughs>